Welcome to The Stream. I'm Femi O'K. And I'm Malika Bilal. Today we look at a topic chosen by you, our online community, around 40 years since the revolution. Now, as events are held to mark the anniversary, we'll look at what the future holds for the country. Send us your comments and your questions via Twitter and our YouTube live chat. Thanks to all who took part in this week's online poll to choose a topic for today's show. Iran, 40 years after the revolution, was the top choice. There will be other opportunities to choose a show in a future poll, but remember, we are always happy to get your ideas for forthcoming shows. Just send them to AJStream on Twitter. Joining us for today's discussion. Nargis Bajoli, she's an assistant professor of Middle East Studies at Don Hopkins University. Saeed Jafari is a journalist at Al Monitor who has reported extensively on Iran. He joins us from Siena, Italy. Sitara Siddiqui is a PhD candidate at the University of Tehran. She joins us from the Iranian capital. And from Amsterdam, we have Peyman Jafari. He is an historian focusing on Iran. Hello, everybody. It's good to have you here. Let's start with some history. It's 40 years since the Islamic Revolution swept Iran. The events of early 1979 were seismic. The revolution forced the ruling Shah into exile and ended more than two millennia of Persian monarchy. For the first part of our discussion, let's take a look back at how the revolution reshaped Iran. Yes, I'm looking at that footage there. I mean, you were, what, minus six at the time, minus ten. There's still a glint in your parents' eye. But you shared a picture with us, which is about ten years after the Iranian revolution. I'm going to show everybody here. Your little brother's there. You're there. Your mum and dad's there. What were the stories that they would tell you as kids about that time? Um, many of the stories were stories of hope of the first few years, uh, first few months, sorry, after the triumph of the revolution. There were, people were very excited. Uh, there was a dynamism and a vibrancy in, in society that they hadn't experienced before, and more than anything, a hope for things being different. But then another uh, story that they would tell me sort of immediately after those stories of hope were um, when my mother was pregnant with me, and this was about two years after the, the revolution um, triumphed, and uh, my father was a part of the leftist groups in Iran, and they were at my grandmother's funeral. Uh, and during the funeral, someone had tipped off the, the um, security um, and intelligence apparatus in their city, and uh, they stormed my grandmother's funeral looking for my dad and my uncle, and they had to run away and go underground for a few months. So it's really those two stories for me kind of sum up in many ways different parts of the, the revolutionary moment in which mm -hmm. there was hope and then later this fierce repression. Mm -hmm. I wanted to share on the back of that another uh, story from a member of our community on her family's experiences. Like you, she was not born at the time of the revolution, but she talks about what she learned about that time from her family. This is Samira, and this is what she told the stream. There's a lot of cultural trauma that exists around the 1979 revolution. Many families were forced into exile, and their security was at risk. My family, along with countless others, had a different experience and they came to the U.S. to pursue their education. They actually wanted to return back to Iran after graduating and unfortunately they were not able to. As a child, I always knew that my parents had immigrated from Iran and it was something that I was curious about. I remember in school we had school projects about where your family's from and what your background is and that I had a different experience than some of my classmates at that time. In high school, I became involved with an Iranian organization in the diaspora, and this ultimately led me to becoming more interested in learning about my history and led me to pursue studying Middle Eastern studies in university. So, Sitare, you could hear what it's like from someone, a member of the diaspora, learning about her parents' homeland. What was it like for you as someone who grew up in Iran? 
Well, the stories that I hear from my parents, obviously, because I was not born during the revolution, um, are just full of hope and aspirations for a better Iran, an uh, Iran would, that would enjoy equality and uh, social justice and uh, also the rule of the religion because the majority of the people at that time were uh, religious. So there were, there were all I hear from my parents and my family members um, is about those aspirations mm. um, and also about a unity among people coming from um, different, you know, social backgrounds uh, or even religious ideas. Uh, they were all united in their aspiration for uh, the end of the tyrannical regime that was ruling over Iran. Paymon, how a country remembers its milestones is so important to its sort of national identity. This moment is a moment that was shared globally and many countries have a view of what the Iranian revolution meant. But for Iranians, not that you can speak for all of them, but from a historian's perspective, what did this moment mean? Well, it was really a rupture. It was a um, continuation of a uh, development that had started in the early 20th century of Iranians aspiring for democracy and fighting for it, uh, wanting to gain national independence because the U.S. had always tried to interfere in Iran. Uh, there had been the 1953 coup d'etat. So this was really a rupture. And as the others uh, were, were telling, this was a moment of aspiration and high hopes. Mm. Um, so for everyone, uh, and it also inspired lots of people around the world. Everybody was looking to Iran. Uh, the Iranian revolution um, to achieve a better Iran. Well, from that historian's point of view, I want to share with you two perspectives that we're seeing online, and these are from people who are not in Iran anymore. This is Donya, who says, as you may know, after Khomeini hijacked the Iranian people's revolution for freedom, its forces began to crack down heavily on society. My family had no option but to leave Iran in the 1980s and become refugees due to Christian persecution. They haven't returned back since, so uh, there is uh, antagonism there for the Islamic revolution. But here on the other side is a view that several people in the U.S. share, but perhaps not so in Iran. Uh, this from Surat, who says, please mention in your program that everything the revolutionaries and global media said about the Shah was pure propaganda against him. Iranian people have a strong sense of respect for the Pahlavis and nostalgia for Iran under them. And I was going to give this to you, Paymon, but as I was reading it, I could see Sitara's yeah. face, their kind of <laughs> smile, ironically. Sitara, what, what are you thinking as I read this? Well, the first thing that I have to tell you is that the name uh, this um, Twitter account has used is the name of a, uh, of a, what do you say, like V-Lane in a TV series that okay. are going on guy. in Iran right yeah, now. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, <laughs> that's what really made me laugh. And uh, it really sounded coming from that person. Um, I mean, it was funny how the words were put together and... Uh, well, I definitely do not agree um, with this uh, person and um, not with the character in the TV <laughs> series either. Yep. If, if I can just say something that's about That's all it. I can add to that. The, um, that tweet, I think, you know, one thing to remember is that the, um, the Iranian revolution was a mass revolution. So it was, and relatively during the time of the revolution itself, not extremely bloody. Um, and so this was a massive revolution against uh, the Shah. And, you know, I, I understand people have different views, but that's one thing we can't forget, that no matter what ended up happening after the revolutionary period itself mm -hmm. and how people feel about the outcome of the revolution, the revolution itself was a massive movement against the Shah. Mm -hmm. Paymon, before we just yeah. move on to, to what's happening yeah. right now, I just I want to show one family picture from 1979, your family. Now, some of the earliest memories that kids have are when they're about three years old. You were about three years old, so you're, you're there. What do you remember? Well, I do remember the first years where I was uh, participating with my mother in the demonstrations um, on a very early stage. <laughs> But I particularly uh, remember the war uh, period, of course, that the war started in September 1980 between Iraq and Iran. 
Uh, and it had a massive impact actually on the course of the revolution because like other revolutions, uh, the Russian revolution, the war broke out and it had uh, the consequence of actually, uh, well, uh, uh, making the state stronger in consolidating its power and repressing the oppositional uh, forces. So I think the, the, the war really dramatically changed the course of the revolution. I hear you there, uh, Paiman, and I want to take that point to push on a little further. Let's move on to life in Iran now. While the Islamic Republic has stood firm in the face of continuous opposition from countries, including the United States, many Iranians have expressed discontent at how the country is run. People who remember the days of the revolution are split on how things have gone since. Have a look at this. We didn't achieve what we wanted. Things have changed and revolutionary values have now worn out. Today, unfortunately, we still suffer from discrimination, favoritism, corruption and lying, even more than at any time under the Shah. I am not dissatisfied with my current situation or my job and income. It is true that some people are complaining about high prices, but they should put things in perspective and be more tolerant. Said, I want to bring you in here as we talk about what life is like now with this tweet from Arash who says, I, 31, am very proud of our great 1979 revolution that brought down a dictatorship and fought for freedom and equality. The corrupt dictatorship ruling Iran today has no right to claim the legacy of the great event since it has betrayed its ideals brazenly. In your view, Said, do the ideals and the ideas of the revolution still hold? Uh, well, I think uh, we still have we still have some kind of uh, some kinds of uh, things that people are still follow. For example, uh, the people 40 years ago went to the street for uh, for asking the freedom, for asking the independence. They were they they were against the dictatorship. They were uh, asking for democracy. Uh, the situation now, I think, in some extent, is changed. Uh, uh, but these these concepts are not uh, they are not absolute. We still have to work. We have still to continue uh, to trying to achieve to our goals. Yeah, we can say in some kind in some cases we can uh, we uh, uh, we were uh, successful, but in some extent no. We have to continue to overcoming obstacles in our way. Yes. Can I, can I add something to that? Yes, yes please do. Uh, well, as a, as a historian, again, I'm always very interested in both change and continuity. As I was telling, the, the Iranian revolution really brought massive change to Iran. If you think of the expansion of political participation, Nargis was already saying that it was a massive uh, revolution. So millions of people participated in that revolution and also demanded a political say. So we, in contemporary Iran, we see people actually engaging in political debates, participating in municipal councils, uh, uh, neighborhood organizations, etc. On the other hand, unfortunately, there is also continuity with the previous regime. The dictatorship of the Shah was toppled, but uh, power has been now concentrated uh, unequally among an elite uh, around the supreme leader. So a participatory population uh, is actually now uh, clashing with those political limitations. So this, these are really the contradictory outcomes of that revolu revolution. So it's not black and white. We have to see both the changes and the continuities. Zetere, that's a, an, add, a historian's like viewpoint, to... but you are actually living mm -hmm. in Iran. Uh, do you concur? Well, I think uh, it's um, the first part I would uh, agree with both uh, um, analyst on the show that um, Iran, Iranian revolution, the Islamic revolution of Iran was a massive movement and uh, all, all types of people took part in that movement. And uh, although Imam Khomeini uh, is the one um, charismatic leader that uh, um, managed to unite all the people, uh, everyone had a share on it. And one of the uh, greatest uh, aspirations of the Iranian people was um, to have a share in the decision making of the country. And I think to a great extent that has been achieved, nothing is perfect. Um, like many other countries, uh, we have a dynamic um, democratic system uh, which has its own faults and needs uh, to be like updated and uh, reformed every 
every few years. So I'm not 100% happy with um, everything that happens around the political decision making. Uh, but I am very happy in the progress that I see making uh, is being made. And I'm very hopeful about the future of the country because as I see um, people of my generation, my uh, age, um, who did not witness the years of the revolution, but who, mm, you know, adhere to those ideals uh, are mm, coming into the scene. They are taking to the um, political arena and um, having a greater share. So, mm, and one thing that I feel needs more improvement on is having even a greater share for the young people in who, who live in Iran. Mm. I'm glad you mentioned the young people there. Nargis, I want to go to you with these, this anecdote here from F.A. Hamid, who says, when I visited Iran in 1998, the children born after the revolution were coming of age. I found them more adept to the new f normal than the older generation who were found lamenting in the constricted environment and cherished the past. And they go on to write, when the revolution came, the pendulum swung from one extreme to the other and is now settling in the middle. Iran needs no intervention and is capable of sorting its own issues. So the settling in the middle is the part I'm hoping you can pick up on. What's your thought on that? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, uh, one of the things is, is, is as uh, both Paimon and Satara were saying, there is this incredible, um, you know, in any society that has a revolution and it's a massive revolution, people are involved in the political process. I mean, it's, it's, it's their involvement that brings an old regime down and brings a new regime in. And so that did not go anywhere. Even though there was repression, people were finding different ways to make their political voices heard and mobilizing from the bottom. And they would mobilize from the bottom of things that they didn't like, and it would force the, the system to, to compromise. So that is definitely there. And I think, as you know, the, the person on Twitter mentioned, it really is the generations that came after the revolution, um, the, the ones who were born in the 80s and the ones who were born you know, in the 90s and early 2000s that I think are beginning to uh, make significant changes in Iran on a cultural and social level. Um, and those are things that are constantly being a, a give and take with the government. But one of the things I would say in that the values of the revolution, some of them I think are gone. But I think one of the ones that hasn't, uh, that hasn't been erased is this uh, clear um, desire for independence. And I think that is something that in the generations that have come after the revolution, even if they no longer agree with the government or even if they are extremely frustrated by the government, they do uh, embrace this identity that Iran needs to be an independent nation free from sort of the neocolonial and colonial environments in which the revolution came out of. Let's just push on just one more time because I want to look at the future and what that holds for Iran. The vast majority of the population only know post-revolutionary rule. But what will the country look like in a few years' time, and will its outlook on the world change? Some people want to start by abandoning one phrase that's often heard at rallies over many years, death to America. The slogan, death to America, is wrong. We shouldn't want death for any country. When we want death for someone, they want the same for us. Our officials say death to America, but some of their children now live and study there. The slogan is not a good thing because it explicitly calls the other side to hostility. I've never said it and I never will. Not all people in Iran say it. Saeed, you can see the, the Western journalists really keen to cover anything that looks like the, the Iranians are, are challenging their authority uh, and their relationship with Iran. Have you seen that change over the years? And do you think that will change in the future? Uh, well, I think uh, we still have some uh, some cliche that uh, that didn't change during the during the years. For example, some slogans that you you showed in your in your video. Some people uh, had comments about the death to America. This is maybe it's some of the some of the cliche that we have to maybe uh, during the within the years we have to change it. Uh, but yeah, I think uh, in answer to your question, yeah, I think uh, it changed. The situation has changed. Uh, our I ideology and our, uh, I think, government, our political system, is going to uh, decrease uh, the radical, the radical attitude 
uh, for example, you cannot compare the situation nowadays with the, what happened in the first first months and first years of the revolution. For example, uh, we didn't have any uh, good relationship with uh, with the world, with the European countries, with even the uh, our neighbors. So you can see you can see these uh, these uh, changes can I in add our point? policy. Yes, that's yeah. right. Go ahead. Uh, well, uh, about the slogan that uh, a part of the video was, uh, I mean, covering that in Iran, uh, I should mention that there are a lot of people who still chant that slogan. And uh, the Farsi words that we use for it does not really mean uh, wishing that for a nation. It directly is, um, uh, I mean, addressing the uh, American government. And we have uh, a lot of reasons to chant that slogan against the uh, American regime because um, uh, they, they support the Shah. Uh, they were the, one, the ones who gave refuge to Shah after he plundered Iranian nation's uh, wealth and ran away from the country. They are the one who um, trained and um, armed a lot of terrorist groups against Iran. They are the one who armed the Saddam uh, brutal regime against Iran. They are the ones who are still sanctioning uh, Iranian people uh, and blocking, um, um, you know, like drugs and medicine on Iran. So Iranian people have a lot of reasons to hate the uh, U.S. regime. And um, you can ask uh, American people who have traveled to Iran how welcome they have felt uh, our uh, our I cannot even say hatred. Our reason to feel that the U.S. is uh, our enemy is based on reason, based on statistics that can and based on history. So mm, it's very important to mm, make a distinguish uh, between the, the two. That the people the people who are chanting that slogan um, actually they're not getting that from the uh, from the Iranian only from the Iranian government. And yes, that's true that there are, um, you know, governmental officials who may chant uh, the same slogan because the people, the majority of the people are chanting those slogans while their own children are living in those countries. And that these are the grievances that exist among uh, Iranian people. And um, actually in the like recent demonstrations that have been uh, whether pro-government or anti-government, they Isn't always that, ask I, I, I hear you there, and I think it's yeah. interesting because despite all of those facts in the U.S., particularly, you still have viewpoints like this. This is Ali who says, Iran has been a pain in the neck for the U.S. So I, I hear those points and those historical facts, and yet you still see this discourse. But I want to push on just a little bit because I wanted to give the view from someone who's looking at this from a historic perspective. This is Shervin, an associate professor, assistant professor here in the U.S., and this is what he told the stream. We underestimate how deeply the Islamic Republic is compromised by its own ideology. It should be unsurprising that a state ostensibly committed to the mobilization of self-reliant and righteous men and women, forever vigilant in the struggle against injustice around the world, should find its own citizens demanding the same commitment at home to the injustices taking place in their own backyard. That the system continues to come up short in this regard guarantees that we will continue to see protests and mass mobilization in Iran not to overthrow the regime, but to press it to do its job to live up to its promises. Payman, in about a couple yeah. sentences, your take on that video. No, I totally agree, agree with that. And I want to add to the fact that, you know, independence is still very important for Iranians. But I think they do have a problem with the perversion of independence into something of continuous animosity and creating, uh, you know, uh, uh, fortress relationships with other countries in the world because there is a long uh, tradition in Iranian history that goes mm -hmm. really to, to the 20th century that is uh, fighting against uh, domestic dictatorship and fighting against uh, foreign uh, sure. uh, imperialism as well. Okay. And I think what Iranians really want is coupling both, having both of them, independence right. and democracy at home. All right, guests, thank you so much for your thoughts on the Iranian revolution, the anniversary 40 years after it occurred. We really appreciate your time. And don't forget to send your comments, your show ideas through Twitter, YouTube, aljazeera.com forward slash the stream. And also have a look at our at AJ Stream Twitter feed because there you can pick different shows to vote for. And then if the highest vote wins, we will do the show like we did today. Thanks for watching. See you next time.